Hello, I'm Robert Greenwald from Brave New Films. Welcome to all of you all over the country and maybe in different parts of the world who are watching. Thank you for joining. And our next guest after today will be Dolores Huerta. So if you're not signed up on Facebook, please do so. So you'll be able to join us for that conversation. And <clears throat> the guest today who wrote the wonderful book, uh, one of the Brave New Films interns kept telling me about this book and about this writer and about this person. So I felt it was only appropriate if the Brave New Films intern person who alerted me to this did the introduction. So, Maya Greenwald. Um, well, this is Susan Burton, and this is her book, Becoming Mrs. Burton. Um, and I was taking a race and ethnicity class at West LA and my teacher, Tiffany, who was supposed to be here today, but she couldn't make it, um, like gave us a choice of two books to read, and I picked this one. And it just goes into how women of color are affected in the justice system and how they're kind of forgotten um, and, and, and not a prison for a long time and turned her life around and started a new place, a new way of life. Yes. <laughs> um, that helps like previously incarcerated women um, be able to come out of prison and get the support and the help they need um, and to like heal the trauma. Yeah. So she is here today with us. Um, and if you could just like start off by maybe talking about like how the book came to be and like when you decided that you wanted your story in a book. Yes. Um. I've been thinking for a while about how to get the story uh, about women and mass incarceration in the mainstream conversation. Uh, been thinking about how it's left out of the conversation when we talk about mass incarceration. And um, I, I wanted to write a book. I tried to do this about four years ago, and I guess it wasn't time yet. Um, so um, the ingredients and the support for writing the book came about through, uh, I think Michelle Alexander helped me out a lot. And um, she, she um, urged me to, to tell my story. And um, so the mix came about and the story got written. What I didn't realize when, while writing the book is that um, I wasn't as healed as I thought I was. And reliving and re-talking about and vividly remembering all of my experience through childhood, through the prison system, um, left me pretty 
left me in a pretty dark place. And I had to go back and visit help and come from under that. And I thought I thought I was all good. But the book has been, uh, I've gotten through that. Uh, the book has been published now. It's out there. And I believe it's, it's uh, creating some conversation um, about the mass incarceration of women and um, how they've been overlooked, um, how they've been not thought of and sort of cast aside but um, and forgotten. So, so I'm, I'm here like waving the flag. You know, remember us. We count too. We're not throwaway women. You know, our lives matter. You know, give us some support. Uh, give us an opportunity. And so, that's... Um, could you talk a little bit about your personal story? Yeah. From, like, a child onward? Because a lot happened. <laughs> yeah, a lot happened. And just, sorry, just before that, I forgot to mention, those of you who are watching, if you have questions on the Facebook page, please post them there. Elizabeth is looking carefully. She will be calling out and uh, asking some of the questions in the room. So feel free to please write. Okay, sorry. Send us questions. Yeah. So my earliest memory um, was of um, counting, counting, um, counting tree, counting these trees, palm trees. You know, here in California, we have a lot of palm trees, and many of the the, the parks and, and, and institutions are decorated with palm trees. So, my one of my earliest memories is riding into um, Camarilla State Hospital uh, with my mother and my auntie. My mother would take my auntie every week to Camarilla Hospital to pick up Curly. Curly was my auntie's boyfriend. And I would count the palm trees while I was trying to evaporate in the back seat of the car. And when we got to palm tree number 22, I knew Curly was gonna walk out of that um, mental hospital. And he was gonna do something to me over that weekend that I couldn't describe and I didn't understand. But instinctively, I knew it was wrong. And when he, um, when he was, when he was caught in the act, and I wanted to say when we were caught in the act, because when when he when he was caught, my auntie began to tell me what a dirty little girl I was, and how bad I was, and how awful I was, and swore me to secrecy. And that was the beginning of um, a young. Um, beginning of, of all types of experiences that um, you know looking back I don't know how I got through them all you know and when I when I was writing the book I thought my god nobody should have to have to weather all of that and the thing of it is is that You know, it's not just my story. It's most of the women who are incarcerated, their experience, their story. I get letters from all over the country to women that I've sent a book to, and they write and say, you know, that's that happened to me too. And when I read your book, uh, you know, I read about me. And... Um, I'm getting the hope, the inspiration, the, ter the determination to, to make a better life for myself too. But I've come to this place that um, what I realized for, for Port and Robert, you weren't supposed to be <laughs> Turn your phones off. Remember whatever you do. Turn your phones off before we start. <laughs> that... Um, We, in this country, 
criminalize women's response to trauma, their ways of coping with trauma, we criminalize it. Whether it's mental health, substance use, um, whatever we use to actually cope with that, we uh, get usually get criminalized for it. It would be so much, so much easier, so much more humane to do other things like have um, uh, victims, victims, abundance of victim services. Like we have an abundance of prisons across this country. We can have abundance of uh, therapy, uh, um, uh, all kinds of things that we could do instead of build more and more institutions, more and more prisons, more and more punishment, more and more um, uh, stripping of your dignity, stripping of your pride, more and more that we build. So, so that's that's it, and, and yeah, and, and 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 I kept I kept holding all of the pain and all the trauma and navigating it until my five-year-old son was killed. And at that point, I just couldn't hang on anymore. And um, I drank, and I drank to drown the pain and the grief of the loss of my five-year-old son. Um, I drank to understand why it was a cop that killed him. I drank to um, to lose myself, uh, and and that escalated to drug use, and drug use sent me to prison um, over and over and over again. And it could have been something different, you know. There could have been a rehab. There could have been a place that had grief counseling. There could have been other ways to deal with it, um, but it was. The war on drugs, our communities that got saturated with crack, and I smoked it. Um, <coughs> and um, the grief learned to swim, and uh, I couldn't drown it out. Uh, and eventually, you know, after six prison terms, you know, six times I was sent to prison. Nobody ever said you're not a bad person. You know you're you have a problem. You have a, a alcohol, a drug problem. You have a grief problem. Uh, but they never did. They told me they cast me off to prison. So um, in the book, you talk about um, learning about like the system's idea of like rehab through a white woman who told you about it. Yeah. Um, what was like? what was going through your head like when you were talking to her about that? Because it had never been presented as an, yeah. an option. I think this was the um, the fourth time I was about to be sentenced to prison. And I was in the back in the concrete uh, uh, holding cell at the criminal courts building and they were talking about giving me five years. You know, the, the, the time got higher and higher, and five years for possession of drugs. And um, there was this woman who told me about CRC, uh, that she was locked up with me, and she had been given a civil addict commitment. Civil, a civil addict commitment means you're not criminalized, you're sent to California Rehabilitation Center. It was still a prison. It still had gun towers, but you didn't walk out of there with a felony conviction. You got a, um, a conviction that said you could rehabilitate and it would be erased from your record. Um, so she told me about CRC, and she told me that I could be out in eight months. Even if they gave me five years, I could be out in eight months. Uh, all I had to do was learn the 12 steps, learn how to recite them, and I knew I could do that. You know, I was I was a pretty I was a pretty smart girl, a pretty smart kid. You know, I was a I was a spelling bee in school, uh, so I knew I knew I knew I could ace that part. Um, but then you had to test every week when you got out of prison, 
I didn't even think that far. Mm -hmm. I just knew I could ace that. Mm -hmm. So I went to CRC. And in CRC, um, California Rehabilitation Center, um, I began to get information about alcoholism and drug addiction. I began to get information about childhood trauma. And it woke up all of the stuff. And um, I would lay in bed at night and I would, I would relive some of my childhood experiences and whatnot. And I went to the teacher one day and um, told her uh, how I was having trouble sleeping and what was going through my head, what I was feeling and what I was thinking. And she told me not to think, not to, not to worry about passing her class. And she was like the when you when you got when you got assigned to Miss Tucker's class, her name was Miss Tucker. When you got assigned to Miss Miss Tucker's, we called it CCEP. You trembled because Miss Tucker would fail the entire class, and 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 you'd have to take it over again. And you know, one person could mess up. And the whole class would, 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 be, would be failed. And you'd have to wait in line to go back to see that class. And you had to pass that class in order to, to go before the board to get out. So she, was, she turned to me and she said, don't worry about it. And when she did that, it was like the first time everyone, anyone had ever acknowledged that something went terribly wrong with my life. And it gave me permission to begin to dive into that and to begin to, to um, say, acknowledge to my own self that something went really wrong. And that began the process of uh, introspect and the process of really looking deeper. Did I go back to prison after that? Yes, I did. Um, but I kept digging and kept, kept looking. Um, my last question, and then um, you guys can ask questions. Um, have you like reconciled with like all the people that have like caused your pain, or is that something like you're still working towards? No, um, I wanted and needed to be my best and strongest self. So I went to the, through the process of forgiveness. Forgiveness to my auntie, forgiveness to my, you know, abusers, forgiveness to the rapists, and forgiveness to me. Um, I'm, 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 uh, yeah, I've reconciled. I've, I've uh, you know, I went through with my mom and, you know, everyone that um, I held this dark place or this, this, this need to to want to get even with or anger with, um, I had to um, let go and forgive in order to uh, be without be without pain. I don't want any more pain. I don't want to uh, walk around hurting inside, angry inside, mean inside. So um, I I went through learning how to forgive. I've reconciled. Is that called reconciliation? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <I guess>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Questions? Yes. Um, I can't believe I'm sitting here with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so it's quite an amazing and powerful story. In your taking everything that has happened and committing to impacting other lives, helping other people, organizing, providing all the amazing services you do. How did that happen? Was it an aha moment that led you? Was it a series of incidents? How did you tell us about that? So after all of the pain and the suffering and the humiliation, the degradation that I went through um, as a um, alcoholic woman as an addict. I found this place in Santa Monica and in Santa Monica the Claire Foundation, the Claire Foundation. Mm -hmm. 
from this place that treated me, you know, with dignity. They recognized my humanity and my talent. They recognized me as a woman, not a woman to be discarded and not thought of, and they treated me on an even keel. And um, it's like, damn, you know, why isn't this in South LA? So many women come back and have no place to go and no place to land. And um, I figured if I could have a place in South LA that women could come to, like the place in Santa Monica, I would heal the world. <laughs> I was so naive. I really yeah. thought, you know, that everything would be just hunky dory. Um, and then, and then, as I when I got the place, I saved my little money and got the place. Um, I began to understand the the um, the racism, the social the, the social injustices, the the. Uh, uh, lack of resources. I, I began to see all this other stuff. And then I began to have another level of forgiveness for myself and for the people in that community. Because a lot of times we want to blame and we want to point fingers and we want someone to take the responsibility for whatever we think is it right. Um, but, you know, the forgiveness got bigger and larger. Uh, and the determination to fight, the determination to stand up and uh, bring other women and to begin to examine and uh, push back on the systems that were feeding into this and feeding that. Yeah. Question? Yes. I have two questions. Um, the first is how do you, in the work you do, bring in the well-being of children and like families. Um, I know recently there's been a lot of activism that's like keep families together with yes. the immigration and detention. Yes. But then simultaneously, like two thirds of women in prison are moms. Yes. So we're separating families through that. Yes. Um, and then my second question is kind of just a wondering how do you feel? It's kind of like a for fun question, but I know that like with. Um, like, how do you feel pop culture is kind of, like, affecting, um, like, criminal justice and, like, prison activism? Mm -hmm. I'm saying this because I know, like, the whole Kim Kardashian thing was in the news, and even, like, mm -hmm. there's a lot of celebrity coming into prison activism, and I wanted to hear how you feel like it can be honed for yeah. your cause. Yeah. Um. The first question about the children. Um, we have a part of a new way of life called Women Organizing for Justice and Opportunity. And it's a leadership training around uh, building the, um, the power, the information, and creating leadership for women who have been incarcerated. And what we have been doing the last year is focusing that on child reunification. Um, as far back as I can remember, um, this country and its systems have been snatching uh, our children, and our babies, little black babies, out of the hands, out of the arms, out of the cars of their moms. And then they make it increasingly difficult for them to reunite uh, with them after um, uh, incarceration or, or to get back together. Um, it's a full-time job. You can imagine a full-time job for a broke woman to meet all the requirements of Department of Children and Family Services, and then a judge still sits there and has the authority to reunite or not reunite after you've completed all of this stuff. Um, I hate to see what I'm seeing at the border, but it's not... It's not the first time I've been seeing it. I've been seeing it year after year after year through the women at A New Way of Life. Uh, and it's horrible. It's horrible for all of us. Um, 
So we are organizing. I, I hired an attorney to actually get into the nuts and bolts and the policies, procedures, and the laws of DCFS to really uh, figure out how we can build a campaign against them, how we can ensure that women have the opportunity to get their babies back, you know, how we can challenge a judge that says no when she's qualified and she's done everything that the court has uh, required her to do. Um, so that's a whole nother, whole nother um, uh, Pandora's box there. Um, and, uh, you know, Kim stepped up and said, uh, 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 open the door, I'm going to the White House, and I'm, you know, give me the key, I'm going to open this, this this woman out, and <laughs> yada, yada, you know. So, uh, good for her, because we have been trying to get Ms. Johnson out for four years. We had been building campaigns, we had been uh, writing petitions, we had appealed to President Obama. Obama. We had been doing all this stuff to get Ms. Johnson out. Mm -hmm. And uh, Kim, you know, saw some of the stuff that we as the formerly incarcerated uh, community had put out there. And she steps up and says, let her out. I want to let you know, Kim, if you watch it <laughs> on Facebook right now, <laughs> I went to do a book talk in Tutwater Prison in Alabama. There's a woman there named Geneva Cooley. She's 71 years old. She's been in prison 15 years. She's been in prison for a drug charge. Her sentence is 999 years, 99 months, and 99 days. So there's a whole lot of kid, there's a whole lot of Miss Johnsons around this nation and there are people who um, have privilege and platforms that can help to um, um, bring attention to mass incarceration and just free up some of those people. I was in Lancaster prison yesterday at this group called the Young, the Young Group. Um, they got my books, the teacher brought it to them, and they asked me to come out and talk to them, and I went. Um, I felt like I was in a room that I was witnessing the process of genocide. These men in the young group were all black and brown men. They had been arrested from the age of 16, 17, 18, and they were 45, 50, and 16. And I felt like I was watching genocide in, in action. So, um, yeah. Geneva Cooley. <laughs> Can the rest of the people watching do anything? Write letters or they call can write letters to where? Yeah, they can write letters to. Um, wow, well, they can write. They can write letters to. I don't want to just send them out in the yeah. universe. Um, but Geneva Cooley is in Tutwiler, uh, in in Montgomery, Alabama. So you can write letters to Equal Justice Initiative to Brian Stevenson. Uh, and ask Brian to um, look into the case further. I've actually got the University of Alabama involved to help to uh, drive some petitions there. You know, they can write letters to the, um, the uh, uh, Alabama legislature. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm only me, but I'm trying to build this little campaign around her, and it might be big. But uh, I'm going there next week to see her. Oh. Yeah. <coughs> Other questions? Mm -hmm. Other question. Yes. Um, from, from your book, and this is maybe um, building off what Robert was talking about, it, it struck me when you first decided to, to do something and you started going to the buses. Yes. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Because I thought that, that story was really 
Anytime a one person is released from prison in the state of California, coming back to LA County, they get off a bus downtown Skid Row at the Greyhound bus station, and uh, you have to make it from there. You're really ill prepared. You have no ID. You have no social security card. So, you know, I got off that bus so many times and I felt so foreign. Felt so, you know, excited but really scared. Um, there's so much dark energy down there in uh, Skid Row. So when I got the house, I knew where to go to meet my friends. I knew where to go to offer a hand up. And I would go down to the bus station downtown Skid Row. Anybody coming from CIW, they arrived there about 1240 in the afternoon. Anybody coming from Northern California, they arrived there about between 5 and 6 in the evening. And I would see my friends and I would say, i got a house. Do you want to, I would see, you know, women getting off the bus and I'm, you know, offer them a bed there, offer them a safe place to come. Um, offer them the, what, what I felt I had received in um, Santa Monica, you know, a welcome, a place to fit, a place to belong, a place to be honored with my humanity. So yeah, I would go down to the bus station and say, hey girl, I got a house. <laughs> and tell us now about the program as it's currently working. You have the house. You have you, are there some additional staff people and yeah. um, about some of the women's lives you've impacted and how people watching can help support your work. Okay. So uh, we now have five houses and um, we house about 32 women and three or four children at a time depending on how many we can snatch back. Um, uh, we also have a, a large range of services for the formerly incarcerated and incarcerated folks. So we do um, voter registration inside of the county jails all across Los Angeles County. We help some other counties to uh, understand how to get in there and also do voter registration. So we have the Civic Participation Department. Uh, we have six attorneys on staff all doing post-conviction work and family reunification, uh, licensing and some litigation around um, uh, 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 bad practices, background check companies, um, County of Los Angeles, you know, people who are just really um, breaking the laws uh, and harming people's opportunity. Um, we have a policy department and a community and a, a organizing department. Well, we have the policy department, and in the policy department is the organizing. So we have a chapter of All of Us Anon that we built out in around 2004, and it organizes the voices of the uh, formerly incarcerated and incarcerated folks. Um, we also um, so participation. We do a lot of stuff now. <laughs> a lot of stuff. So there's a, I, it's, there's about 26 staff now at A New Way of Life. Okay. Uh, we've helped over a thousand women through our housing and over 300 <coughs> people, um, 300 children, we've helped to reunite with their moms. You know, if people want to get involved and want to help, um, they can go to a anewwayoflife.org and there are ways to volunteer, and there are ways to uh, give uh, support, financial support, and we need that financial support. So here now, um, I feel like, uh, I know that a new way of life is a model that works, uh, that builds the, um, the, the dignity, help people regain their dignity, their respect, and their place in, in, the, in the community. So now I'm replicating. Uh, I have uh, created a replication model and I'm teaching people how to replicate what I've done uh, around reentry. So we have one home up in the Bronx in New York. It's called Hope House, uh, Topeka Sam. Uh, Topeka Sam is the woman who did the video on Mike that got Kim Kardashian's attention. <laughs> Go figure. Um, <laughs> 
And then Cal, Star, Cal State Fullerton uh, will be opening a house that we're teaching them to open for their Upward, their upward Bound program. Uh, it'll be housing for people who are going after their um, bachelor's and master's or PhDs uh, out of Cal State Fullerton. And um, San Diego called me a couple of days ago and said they wanted to put a house up. So it's all about doubling down and multiplying and uh, giving people the support and skills and encouragement to bring people back into the community and support them to be the best people that they can be. And I'm excited. Yeah, I'm excited. Yes. Are you, you pick her up. Yeah. <laughs> um, something so powerful about your story, I think, is that you yourself experienced this. I'm wondering, among like your staff and these replication models, to what level um, are other formerly incarcerated people like, at the helm um, doing this work? Yeah, so there's quite a few of us out here, out here in the across the nation who have built up and built out organizations, uh, and um, I think it's a, about providing opportunity. Um, so the places I've identified uh, are all formerly incarcerated people. Even Cal State San Diego, mm -hmm. a professor who's formerly incarcerated, contacted me. Um, um, Topeka Sam, she's formerly incarcerated. Fullerton, I helped them with um, um, hiring the formerly incarcerated person for their Upward Bound program. Uh, but the, the professor who, he's not, but, but um, uh, the person who's running the house is. Uh, so it's really about trying to help people, trying to help directly impacted to build their leadership out and build strength back in the community that, that where that strength has been, you know, really uh, demised and, and, and taken and locked up. When I go into these prisons, I see so much power in the people, um, and I understand that power, and I understand what's being done to it. You know, how do, how do we unleash that for the good of the country, for the good of the world, for the good of the communities? How do we just unleash that power? You're precious. It's <laughs> <laughs> called Eagle River. And Eagle River, River had a, like, I guess the living room was about the size of this room. And the whole front, or that, that wall right there, that entire wall was a big picture window that we could just sit in the living room and look out, look out at. And they had classes, and we had rooms, and we had keys, and um, the uh, prison kind of looked like Better Homes and Gardens. <laughs> you know, it would, it would be a picture out of Better Homes and Gardens. Um, and, um, you know, they, 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 would, they would go out and hunt and bring back fresh meat and salmon and, you know, seafood and, and, and you know, it was just so much different. It wasn't a, a concrete cage. You know, it wasn't, you know, the, it wasn't, you know, like this, this stripping of your, your dignity, stripping of your, your um, individuality. Um, uh, we, yeah, and it was um, just so much, much more different. When I got back here and um, so I, after my son was killed, I tried to run away to Alaska and got in trouble. But when I got back here and was put in civil brand, civil brand you know, they, they sprayed you with, with lice stuff and they uh, cut your hair if it was too long and your fingernails and put you in uniforms and fed you food that you didn't run, really wasn't didn't wasn't, didn't know what you were eating. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't no salmon or 
or bison or you know there wasn't any of that uh, you weren't sure what you were eating <laughs> and the guards were mean to you and uh, so big big difference and the an argument uh, playing devil's advocate a little bit so what are you doing in your program that is helping people not go back to prison again and how is that different from other programs or how is that providing something that people need in order not to go back to prison? Um, so I think that, you know, I'd like to think, well, I, I, I wouldn't like to think, I know that we motivate people to dream again. We motivate people to think about what their lives would want to be, what their legacy would like to be. We motivate them to, not only in, in, in ways that, you know, um, uh, if I fly out to a conference, I might take a couple of residents with me. You know, when I go down to the Board of Supervisors, they go with me. You know, I take them up to Sacramento, and I just expose them to the world as I know it, the world as you know it, not the world that 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 they're relegated to um you know they have they have opportunity options and choices um we provide them with the cook you know we provide them with the lawyer uh, we give them the tools to to fight with so just to cook for the dinner meal because i want everybody to be able to come in and have a good meal after they've been out struggling and fighting and and, and trying to get their lives together that be it with their mental health or with a social worker or with a parole agent or what have you. We want to have a, a regular course meal every day for people when they get home. Um, so, and, and then I hold them to a level of accountability. I don't make them, um, I don't make them uh, uh, do what I think they should do. I ask them what they want to do and then when they say what they want to do, I support them and hold them to the level of accountability for what they say they want to do. They can change their mind, like you change a major or you change the direction of your, you can change your mind, but you know, you are supported to do something and you must be doing something. Mm -hmm. You know, so you just, yeah. So I think, I think that's a little mm -hmm. different. A lot of times um, <clears throat> you go into a place and they have everything that you have to do that's laid out that's programmatic and everybody goes into that and they go to this group and they go to that group and they go but well no this is what do you want to do we have a job developer on staff and she will help you start a business she will help you do uh, she will help you get your license you know whatever it is that you need want to do we'll help you do it but you have to do something you can't do nothing in the way of life the clock's ticking what is your legacy what do you want your legacy to be? And is there a particular part of that that you're finding has the most impact, or it's the whole program in general with all of these uh, services and support? Um, I think what part of what has the biggest impact is uh, the exposure, where they are able to see how different people, different cultures, different places are, are living and, and thinking and being. Um, you know, you get a taste of flying to a conference and you want to, and you're on a panel and people are seeing you, honoring you, respecting you. You want more of that, so you got to work toward that. You, you know, so the exposure, I think the exposure is the, um, one of the biggest things that, that, that allows them to uh, get back on on board. Of course, the job, the school, and mm -hmm. and the stability, being stable. It reminds me very much of Father Greg Boyle, who was yes. here speaking, yeah. sitting in the same seat. Yes, and he yes. would say the same thing. He'd fly around the country and bring some of the yes. owners with them and yeah. give them an opportunity. Give them an opportunity to see the world. Yeah. yeah. He talks a lot, and they use a lot of. Uh, they do a lot of therapy at yes. Homeboys. Is that part of your program? We have a therapist. Uh, we have a therapist. We have our very own Dr. Phil. Um, yeah, yeah. His name is Philip, and we have, <laughs> we, 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 have, we, have our, we have our very own Dr. Phil, and um, 
I think one of the most important parts of my um, development or redevelopment was being able to sit with the therapist every week uh, and be able to work through some of the difficulties of my past and the difficulties of the future. So uh, we have a therapist there um, and the, they, can, they can sign up for therapy. Uh, sometimes I spot something and I'll uh, makes therapy a requirement, but sometimes we don't like to take our medicine. So I, I'm like, you, you need some medicine, <laughs> and and I'll you know say, you promised me you'll go to four sessions, and then if you don't want to go anymore, okay, but give you a chance at four sessions. So. And it's all one on one, or is it group therapy too? One on one, one on one. We have morning meditation every morning, um, where we um, uh, get together at eight o'clock. Um, and we, as a, as a unit, we read from the Hazelton book um, of, of women, recovering women, and we set goals and we listen to the positive message in the book about whatever it is for that day. Uh, they tell me yesterday it was about love. I got there late, I didn't make it. <laughs> but when I got there, I'm like, how was meditation? It was good, Miss Burton, it was about love. <laughs> What's your dream for a new way of life ministry for the future? Yeah. So um, I dream that uh, it will be replicated and be stood out as a model for the country as a way in which uh, we could, um, as a component to the ending of mass incarceration. That there's a little house in all neighborhoods all across the country and uh, it, it's recognized, it's respected, and it's supported uh, as a good, as a good place, a good tool. Uh, yeah. Well, yes, that was a perfect ending. So everyone watching, you yes. know how to support, help. You need volunteers. You need yes. financial support, and everyone has a little house in their neighborhood. <laughs> a house in a book. Yes. <laughs> yes. A house and a book. So it's becoming Miss Burton from prison to recovery to leading the fight for incarcerated women. And um, get the book, put it in the house. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is pretty cool. Thank you so much.